Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Bible Study from the Garage. That's right. I love it that we're back in the garage again, and glad you're joining us here today. You know, I, I think we got some fun stuff to talk about. We're going to talk about these sneaky Colossians. The Colossians? In yeah. Colossi? In Colossi. I yeah, like yeah. it. It's fancy. Yeah. I it thought we were like... going to talk about Star Wars. Well, we might talk about, you know, some, <laughs> some things that are relatable. <laughs> we're going to read Colossians. Chapter 1, uh, verses 9 to 20. All right, make it happen. It's it's going to be... Uh, wow, i got lots of questions, too. Oh, we I got lots questions. of questions. i got questions lots of notes. Oh, too many, too, so many. Too many notes. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you know, tell people it. how many notes we have. we got great things to say to people today. <laughs> well, let's, let's read it. Colossians. All right, Colossians. Uh, chapter 1, verses 9 to 20. For this reason, since the day we heard it, we have not ceased praying for you and asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you may lead lives worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him as you bear fruit in every good work and as you grow in the knowledge of God. May you be strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power and may you be prepared to endure everything with patience while joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us, transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he may come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. He said some of my favorite things there at the end. Oh, this is core stuff today. Oh, I think we found a good one. But let's say a quick prayer here, <laughs> if you'll join together with me. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the gift of life itself. And this time together, we give you thanks for Jesus and his, his death on the cross for us. Help us to comprehend what that means. And help us to understand that you make us into the body of Christ. Help us to rejoice in all that's been revealed to us through Jesus. Help us to know that we know all we need to know about you. And when we have doubts or questions or when we wonder, help us to know that we can find hope and healing through Jesus. In whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, that, that was a good one. <laughs> oh, I like that encouragement. I okay. like that encouragement. That was a yeah. good one. It was a good we one. Because we're going to talk about healing. We're going to talk about a lot of things. But we got to do some Bible basics first. We do. So where is Colossae? Well, you know, it's just 15 kilometers away from Laodicea. <laughs> <laughs> Does that help you? You know, I've been to Laodicea. They have this awesome restaurant down they, on the they corner do. of, of yeah. A and B Street. It's what I, but that's the place, I think, in the book of Revelations where he says, well, you're lukewarm, so I'm going to spit you out. Uh, and so, you know, we should know there then where, where it is. So Colossae was about 125 uh, kilometers or so from uh, the Mediterranean on the, the uh, western side of Turkey. Okay. It is modern day Turkey. Okay. So uh, Asia Minor in the Bible times of St. Sure. Paul. But, you know, as we think about that area, it was a, a powerful area of the growth of the church. Sure. And and St. Paul uh, traveled through it in his missionary journeys. And, and the early church began to spread from the Holy Land and move uh, out to the rest of the Mediterranean and out to the rest of the world. And so Colossae was a place that you know had been really a, a seat of power and a, and a big place in the past. And during St. Paul, was it on its downswing? Maybe. It wasn't what it once was in the glory days. Sure. But it's a place where the church had 
begun to grow. So, so much so, Paul, we've got a letter. St. Paul <laughs> writes it. And, and when he says, I hear, you know, about you guys, that means he, he probably hasn't there. visited. Yeah. Even when we think about the, Col- the book uh, or the letter to the Colossians, I should say, uh, most people would say it's a disputed letter of St. Paul. And many scholars today say St. Paul definitely didn't write it because it has a different vocabulary. It has a different theology from well, what he, he preaches and teaches other places. And, and so today, as we look at it, you know, maybe we can start to think about that. Some people think it's a scholar or not a scholar, a, a student. Yeah. Maybe a scribe. Uh, yeah, maybe a scribe because St. Paul no longer could, could write. Sure. Uh, but but maybe a student who wrote it. The interesting Somebody part, educated, though. Yeah. Because it follows the formula of ancient letters. It does. And so, you know, it follows that, that ancient one where just like we have a greeting, you know, <laughs> dear so-and-so. Um, but it, it has that, that letter. And so we hear a thanksgiving right. um, at the beginning of uh, our reading here there's uh this thanksgiving so i mean it reads like he's blessing somebody clearly though i think right in the first line he says since the day we heard it he's clearly got an entourage well that's plural right yeah Yeah, yeah. who's this we that he's talking about that's one of the great questions yeah i don't know and we have this idea though that um you have everything you need Right, and I think part of the question here, or I think the big question it's asking is, do you have what you need? And the answer is, yes, you do. Well, that's Saint Paul's point of view. Right. There were these opponents, and so we get to hear half of the conversation, and we can kind of what's the word? We can we can fill in the blanks of what his opponents we might be were able saying. To interpolate, maybe, interpolate or, or extract from what sure, we have. Derive, maybe. I don't these know are what these are the words I'm looking for. These derive, are the words. Derive. Uh, these, you know, these are the droids. Interpolate. <laughs> this is this is it. And so Saint Paul came, uh, you know, to to communicate with these people he had never met. But there had been some teachers already who had come to found the church, and there was some conflict about right thinking and teaching and not you know there's a word for this in the church we don't use it much today called heresy heresy yeah. you know can i just take whatever i want and and say that's christian or is there an actual straight teaching and in colossi we find out there was this friction with the gnostics and there were people coming and presenting themselves as true teachers and saint paul is saying these people were telling you you don't yeah. have everything you need. These people were coming and telling you that you need some secret knowledge or some secret. You know, you're doing great, but you're just missing this one thing that I, of course, I can fill in the blank and tell you. All right. Well, it's starting to sound pretty Lutheran to me. So, so St. Paul is saying, no, you guys have. have. You've got, as one of my professors said, you've got the whole enchilada. <laughs> If you've got Jesus, you've got the whole enchilada. And in fact, you know, that understanding of the cross sure. is really that whole. It's not the partial meal deal. It's not, it's the, you know, half of it. Deal. This is this is everything you need. Yeah. There's everything visible and invisible. That is one of the interesting things, that there is this invisible God that's out there. But Jesus comes to reveal, you know, this visible you know, what can we know about God? Well, there might be hidden things. There might be things we can't know. The but, mystery. But the visible, you know, everything we need to know about who God is, is displayed and revealed to us through the working and person of Jesus Christ. So St. Paul's saying you don't need to listen to these people? I mean, it sounds like somebody's trying to create a hierarchy or, or build some sort of authority. Well, teachers to like to between. say, hey, I- I'm the teacher and without me... <laughs> You don't know anything. So it, it, sometimes pastors do that. <laughs> sometimes pastors, sometimes church people do that and say, well, you got some good ideas, but you're wrong. Oh, right, well, yeah, and so St. Paul is in a fight. There is, in the early church, this this idea that the early church was a, a very peaceful and quiet. St. Paul, over and over again, is in conflict. Sure. And, and you know, today, as we think about the conflicts we face it, as the church... Everybody wants to go to church and be happy and peaceful. 
Yeah, but what does peace mean? Well, we're going to get to that at the end. So is there a verse at the end that talks specifically about that and how we find peace? There is. That jet's finding it right now. Oh, <laughs> it's very inner peace. Yeah, it says, uh, and through him God was pleased to reconcile himself all things, yeah. uh, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. Yeah, so there's a specific way that God is going to come and fix the broken conflict that's happening. And and is that peace with each other? Is that peace with God? This interesting word of reconcile. Reconcile. It's very important. You know, you don't have to reconcile with people who you love and get along with all the time. (laughs) You only reconcile with somebody who there's been a fracture (laughs) in the relationship. But you're supposed to love everyone. Including your enemy. You do, but you probably don't don't need to reconcile with somebody who you agree with. So we've talked about reconciliation a lot, especially, you know, we've talked about what poverty is, right? Hmm. In the North American view that poverty is somehow related to money, wealth. And when in reality... It's a little bit about money. It's it's true. A little bit. But that's not the only way. But about 90% of it is a sociological or psychological restoration that needs to occur, right? with relationships to the earth, the community, your okay. family, to God, to a variety of different things, so that you can become whole again. Yeah, even with yourself. Even yeah, with yourself. That's, that's you probably, saying. you know, yeah. uh, one of the top ones, right? Yeah. And having a good, rela- healthy relationship with yourself, I think, is very important, right? When we've talked about mental illness, we've talked about, uh, you know, what leads to homelessness and things like that. So this reconciliation to himself, to all things... Yeah, how everything. Far, how far do you take that? Well, it says all. Is the translation good? Is I, all yeah. really what's uh, intended? It, in well, the, the Greek word, uh, you know, uh, means everything. But that means not just people. Does that mean, you know, rocks and trees and oceans? And today, as we think about our environment, Getting and, a little, and getting a little Star Wars. Oh, right now. I think Obi-Wan's we're there. <laughs> you know, all <laughs> things have a power, and you know, we don't want to do that. Anyway, but you know, this idea that that all things need to be brought into harmony. Well, what is it? Reconciliation, Reconciliation with God. What does that God? word mean? Reconciliation with God. I think it's it has to do with the right working relationship I, that things are are the way they're supposed to and intended to be and not everybody agrees with this well that's what i know? do in engineering actually my engineering niche has a lot to do with i love it tell me assuring more. that yeah. things operate as intended Interesting. it's a reconciliation of a design of a complex system yeah. that it works as intended and how you prove that right I now, like that. So yeah. that's, you know, engineering science. That's what I'm trained to do. Well, that's an interesting. Now I'm seeing it spiritually. Yeah, yeah. Well, often when we talk about reconciliation, we reconcile our bank accounts. <laughs> and so often there's a debt that's owed and it has to be paid. Sure. That's often the imagery. And so I like that you're expanding this from just the financial sure. balancing of the accounts and where there's debt or where there's not something to, to think about this understanding relationally. And that, that you know, as an engineer... We, we, you know, talk about the relationality. Yeah, absolutely. Of things in space and time and how it works together. It, it, that systems idea versus it's just a, a thing. Uh, the one. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that I, God is reconciling. That's what Jesus is. God is doing something in Jesus. And what is he doing in Jesus? Reconciling. It's an There's a specific thing thing that God is doing and I think as you know I work as a pastor and think uh, how do you communicate that to people a lot of people want to talk about well what's Christmas about what's Easter about what is this you know Christ event what is Jesus's ministry was he just there to feed people oh, I think or you're on to something really make important. you know hungry people or heal people who had infirmities the work of Jesus and what happens in the cross is really you know something that's hard to try and encapsulate in a few words and and the book of colossians is doing so good there to say it, all things are going to come back to this plan and purpose i think you know you know jesus i, I don't see it uh, i think a lot of people kind of view it as he's trying to save me from suffering but i think mm. he saves you through suffering Right, well, it's this not is here, one of the interesting right? things. Yeah, he's a focal point in in history. Yeah. It's very important. We see the end of the sacrificial period, 
we see this reconciliation of humans aren't perfect, right? Everything that comes before that is trying to follow the law. And now suddenly it's, listen, I'm going to forgive all that because I know you're not perfect. There is no utopia per se. And you're going to have to take some responsibility for reconciliation of your flaws, your sins, whatever you want to call it, right? Mm. And, you know, it really opens up the idea of looking at humanity instead of forcing humanity to conform or comply with something, right? And this opens up, I think, the opportunity for love. Oh, I think, you know, you're, you're creating a nice, like an engineer, a nice flow chart here. <laughs> I, I like that you're, you know, workshopping. Sketch it out for I, it. I love that you're workshopping the schema, is what it's called, or the different, well, you know, maybe model. Well, rigid, of, but yeah, no, there you I, go. I, Throw I it out there. Well, we have to. Tear it apart. And St. Paul uses these different ways to talk about what happens in Jesus. You know, what happens in Jesus' death on the cross? And here he, he helps us. Luther was good on this. To know Christ is to know his benefits, <laughs> is what Luther wanted to teach in the small category. To know Jesus is to know what he's offering, to know what you get through a relationship with him. And here we find reconciliation and peace. Are well, first we things. say, in whom we have redemption, yeah. the forgiveness of sins. Yeah, I forgive you. And all of a sudden it's, wow, a yeah. weight gets lifted off, and now there's nothing but opportunity and so I think, is the next step reconciliation? Well, in the flow chart here. Is <laughs> <laughs> well, what you're saying is, is I'm oh going to need goodness. something from you. I'm falling into be that trap. Well, no, before we can get, we, we can't just skip to the end. No. There is a process. That's there is a, what I'm getting at. And this is the idea, there is a transaction. <laughs> and so often redemption or, you know, the work of Jesus, there's a, there's a word called soteriology. You know, any oh ology goodness, means the study right of salvation. Okay. So what is the what is the transaction? And that Jesus dies for us. His blood somehow it buys us back. We've been bought not with silver and gold, but with but the with blood, blood of Jesus. And this transactional thing. Is it that God needed something for the reconciliation? Is it that we needed something for the reconciliation? And like you said, it's through Jesus and the brutal death that humans do. Now, did humans do this and God's plan went awry or was this God's plan to change human hearts? I, I can't speak for God. I have no idea. Well, <laughs> we just heard we can look at the this, invisible God right? is revealed in the visible the God. So what you said, I can't speak for God. I can't, but Jesus can. Sure. And Jesus did come as the good news, as the message from God to make known something, to to bring a, is something to bear on our lives and to help us to understand who God is and what God wants. Okay, so yeah. what do I so with this little snippet then, yeah. what do, what do I do with it? Is it just a thanksgiving? Is it just providing me insight? What do I do next? Yeah, it's great. I you know, I think there's a couple of different sections in this and yeah. you know, is there a call to action? Well, if St. Paul is in this place of conflict with these opponents and Colossae is this place of uh, not of unusual conflict, but the disagreements. And St. Paul comes in saying, oh, you have everything you needed. The fullness of God was pleased to dwell in Jesus. You don't only have a partial knowledge of Jesus, you have the whole knowledge. And people who are telling you something, they're not part of the light. They're part of the dark. dark you know, and here's, you know, that light and dark theme we see throughout the scriptures. It's a, you know, way of trying to symbolically talk about spiritual realities. And what does light and dark mean? <laughs> you know, even today we, we talk about... Whole separate, we need a well, whole separate Bible study. We, could, we, about light we, we could, but, you know, <laughs> today even our language of finding enlightenment. Sure. And, and that Jesus is the one who brings to light. Jesus is the light of the world, according to the Gospel of John. That everything we see in Jesus helps us to understand. And so what do we learn from this? St. Paul is saying, you don't need to look to other teachers. You don't need to read the book that they just wrote sure. or go to their sermon. Sure. But go to Jesus. Go to the source. And what does he say? The first fruits of right. the resurrection. So what can we know about our future? You know, what can we know about what God wants from us? You know, Jesus is the pioneer and perfecter of the faith is what often people have said. Sure. And, and, you know, when we think about that, that, that Jesus is everything we need to know. 
Um, there might be more about God that stands, you know, hidden, or sure. it was Luther's language, the hidden God and the revealed God, but the invisible God. Sure. Yeah, and so what do we do with this? I think, number one, we stay committed to understanding who Jesus is and what he did. And we, we continually come back to Jesus when, when we feel lost, when we feel hurt, when we feel in pain, we come back to Jesus knowing that it's through him that we find this peace. We find this reconciliation. We find this redemption that we talk about in the church. And, and that ultimately, that's going to be a healing process. So could we apply uh, the idea of repentance here in terms Ooh. of always turning back, you know? Or yeah. how about the idea that uh, maybe Christians worry too much about what to think and how to act and what to believe, and instead they should just emulate Christ I, I as think a priority? That's, so there have been different strands of Christianity. <laughs> there have been. You know, and even in the Lutheran world, piety. Sure. You know, uh, we don't need to give you the pass, uh, you know, whole thing, but where's your devotion to Jesus? And so that's what the pietists were all about, was this personal devotion to Jesus. You know, my personal connection and relationship and, and my life lived, you know, loving God and other people because of Jesus. I don't need to have the correct theology or thinking or pass the test. But in the history of Lutheranism, there's been this tension between the orthodox, you know, you got to have the right theology. Sure. And uh, other people said, well, you know, the right words are great. But Jesus loves us even if we don't get the right words. And, you know, there is well, this... isn't that part of the reconciliation we're talking about right there? Well, I mean, isn't there something that needs to be reconciled there? I think there is. Of, yeah. You know, measuring how you act like Jesus, being kind and taking care of the poor and all this other kind of stuff, versus, oh, I said all the right things and I read all the right books and I filled all the right paperwork and... This is part of it, yeah. And so I think what St. Paul is, is bringing in, especially in the beginning part, is, you know, these people who want to talk to you about who Jesus is and what he do, you know, it's great, you know, but go to Jesus. And at the end, he wants to talk about the work of Jesus. And, and he's really lifting up, were these his words or is this a, a church hymn is the language? Sure. Is this something he wrote or is he quoting something else? Because it seems to flow and be poetic. You know, and, and maybe it comes from the early, you know, hymnody is okay. the language. It was a song that Christian the early church, thing. you know, had, uh, you know, and that he's appealing to as an authority. Sure. You know, uh, today would we do that? Well, as, you know, Bono said, you know, <laughs> one more in the name of love, you know, we got to you know, lift that up there, you know. I, I hope we'll, we'll think about your question, which I really like. You know, what do we do with this? What, what does it mean for us today? Um, St. Paul wrote this 2,000 years ago. You know, what does it mean? Does it still apply? And I think our life lived in community, we still have struggles with other people. For sure. How do we get along? And, and, and what is it that the church is engaged in? I think ultimately, I wish it was the Lutheran church, but I, I believe it's the Anglican church that says, you know, the, the mission of the church is to, you know, bring all people into unity with God and with each other you know the work of the church as the body of christ not the head <laughs> we've been instructed in this ministry of reconciliation sure. in this ministry of peace i i just yeah. I, to me the idea of um restoration reconciliation uh of relationships uh family earth god all these these really critical foundational relationships that need to exist for humans to be um uh, healthy maybe, yeah. maybe being at peace is part of that right and um without it you know we'll be in conflict and struggle and um, um maybe even cut other humans out mm. because we don't value them yeah. the way jesus did and um so so this reconciliation to himself in all things is really important uh, and i think it becomes very foundational into the not just the sense of community or even the body of the church, but what's right for humans in terms of the way we interact and talk to each other, uh, the way we help each other. And I'm not saying it has to be you know, without boundaries because we certainly want to reconcile, to get to a healthy place so that we're in a position to help others if they want to be helped. Um, um, but we also can't let that darkness 
destroy all the reconciliation effort that we put forward in the first place. And it's so it's a yeah. constant sort of uh, understanding. And we should never judge anybody because you're never going to be perfect at doing this, right? It, it's yeah. I'm trying, but maybe I'm I'm in a point in my life where there's some weakness and I can't or the the roles have been reversed and now I need help restor well, with restoration and reconciliation. Yeah. Um so the power dynamics in that yeah. might not be there. And and what I hear you kind of lifting up is, you know, even what I hear a lot of people, you know, is this a negotiation to find peace? <laughs> you know, in our peace treaties, that's what they do. They oh. they begin negotiations. And then the question is always well, what compromises do we have to well, make? Compromises don't work because there's no resolution in a compromise. There's and, just a uh, a point where we achieve stasis, and you know we see this with a lot of peace treaties. Yeah. It's violence is occurring, therefore we need to compromise to stop it. But there actually is no resolution because we see the uh, restoration of violence. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, you know they can't be, and and you know. People can, uh, through pride, which is probably the worst and most, but but also probably the most subtle sin, uh, they get in the way. They hold on to an idea that's that's um, that they're trying to force it, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's not just restoration. It's like I want to impose a different idea instead of viewing okay. what it may be natural and and trying to find resolution that way. I think reconciliation doesn't mean we're going to. Uh, layer on something that's artificial. If there's something about getting to the truth here about the the universe uh, that I think is very important, and that we shouldn't deny who we are, but recognize who we are, and then we can achieve yeah. reconciliation. So that first reconciliation probably is with yourself and God, not with the community or the earth or anything else. It's got to be that's the first one. Put you in a position of. Um, uh, to take action or to help if people need it uh, i i don't you know i don't know how this occurs uh, you know on an overall everyday basis but i think this idea of you know even the simple thing you know people will even wear the bands you know what would jesus do or something like that just to stop and think yeah. about what can i do in this situation it doesn't mean you always have to do something it just means are you thinking about it and that a strong relationship that you may have, that restoration of the relationship you have with God, for example, might give you some information on what do I need to do in this particular situation? How do I need to act? And, uh, or uh, what do I need to bring to this? Or maybe what do I need to, how do I extricate myself from this situation, right? You know, where I'm at is in darkness and I need to come out of it. How do I go about doing that, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that is a constant effort. Well, that's you don't just things, achieve it, and there you are. That you know? that I like. So this idea, though, that can I get myself out of the darkness? You know what we hear in this is. I you say know, Jesus that, has uh, rescued through the blood us. of the cross. Yeah, it's not something we're able to achieve or right. accomplish on our own, but it's this new reality. So um, that's like a tool in my tool bag. bag. Well, that Jesus <laughs> comes as as a guy on a rescue mission. That Jesus sure. comes as somebody who's who's on a mission for us. So I, I really appreciate the conversation, and I hope that you've enjoyed us uh, for another episode of Bible study from the garage. God bless. Blessings. <laughs>